coast on the day the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Too good, good morning again, Rob. Always fun to be here, especially on Friday. Always Friday's a good day. Good to have you, Admiral. Yeah. Good to have you. You're a good man. You get a lot of you get a lot of candy out last night, Bill. Yeah, we we live on a private driveway, a long driveway. So as I said earlier, we have not had a Halloween cricket treater for since we lived there. I'm kind of disappointed. I always enjoyed that. Have you thought about uh, maybe putting down the drawbridge as a way of getting over the moat so the kids can get <laughs> keep, to your castle Keep safely. them away from the alligators. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Also, welcome in Senator Jason Barrett this morning. JB, welcome back. Good morning. Thanks for having me back. Twice in one week. I'm, two I'm honored. In th- I think it's two and three days. Two and three, three days. Right? That's, that's even better. Yes, you're right. Yeah, very nice. Uh, via telephone, Sam Petsonk is with us as well. Sam, welcome back to the show. Good to have you. Thank you, Rob. Good to be here. Sam, the Democratic Party analyst uh, and uh, very much involved in Democratic Party politics, not just in the state, but nationally as well. And uh, if we could, Sam, I'd like to go through some of the races and start first with the governor's race in West Virginia. And I know there was, uh, I guess, the first and only debate that the two candidates, uh, Steve Williams and Patrick Morrissey, uh, did for this. I guess it was in Fairmont, and we, there were some watch parties around uh, different parts of the state, too, so people could observe this. What were your thoughts on that debate? Well, uh, I thought we heard from the candidates uh, you know, pretty much what we expected to hear. That Steve Williams has been consistent as the Democratic candidate, uh, saying freedom is on the ballot. You heard him say that. That's reproductive freedom. That's the freedom from high health care prices. West Virginia's got the highest health insurance prices, uh, essentially in the country, certainly in the eastern United States. And... Um, and, and uh, he's been, you know, talking about financial freedom, the, the, the uh, b- building better jobs. We've got new factories, new uh, job opportunities in West Virginia because of Democratic investments. So, so that was Steve's message. And then Morrissey was, uh, you know, uh, telling people he'll cut taxes, audit state government, uh, sort of the Project 2025 for the state of West Virginia, uh, further cut uh, retiree benefits. It's just, you know unsurprising but i thought it was you know a fair depiction of what each candidate stands for jason what did you think of it well i, I certainly applaud uh attorney general morrissey for wanting to continue to put money in the pockets of working west virginians and i don't think that's uh, at all related to any project 2025 i think that uh um, patrick morrissey has done everything necessary in this campaign to, to cruise to an easy victory uh, and I think he has, um, you know, the experience as AG of, of taking on the federal government. I think auditing the state government in certain uh, agencies is really important. And, you know, we're starting to see some of that uh, with DHHR, with breaking that up into uh, three different agencies. There was an audit done of uh, education uh, several back in 2012, 12, 2013. So I, I think auditing uh, where taxpayers spend money is a good thing. And I think putting money back into the pockets of working West Virginians is a great thing. Bill, did you observe the debate? I did not observe. I heard quite a bit about it from various sources. Uh, and I applaud the fact that both candidates are there. We need more of these. Uh, and uh, uh, as, uh, as was said by one of the analysts, that there are a lot of questions asked for the first debate. It would have been nice if there had been a second debate to follow up and explore it even more. But we did not have that. But at least we had one debate. So we take what we have and, and appreciate that. Sam, was there a reason to include any of the minor party candidates in the state, the Libertarian, the Mountain, and uh, the Constitution candidate, who's a local fellow, S. Marshall Wilson? Yeah, I've heard a lot of people really disappointed that S. Marshall Wilson, candidate for governor, was not a, he, you know included in this debate. I think a lot of uh, Republicans have been supporting uh, uh, Marshall Wilson. A lot of people uh, we have the you know a strong. Uh, a constitution and libertarian party in West Virginia that felt excluded in that debate. Uh, historically, uh, those parties have uh, had an important voice in the state, so it was a shame they weren't there. But, uh, you know, uh, obviously they care about freedom, and a lot of people want to hear from these candidates uh, more. I mean, uh, we've already audited the state a million times. You know, the question is, what are you going to do about it? That's the that's what people wanted to hear. I think Marshall Wilson's voice would have been really important there. Sam, do you, ha- do you have any idea, Sam, who made that call? I assume that it was the, uh, you know, M- Metro News. That typ- Metro News has typically not wanted to do debates with third-party candidates over the years. 
Well, I mean, I we're talking about third party candidates that are polling low single digits. And I look, I understand that that Democrats out here want Marshall Wilson and uh, Constitution Party and Libertarian Party uh, candidates on the ballot because the conventional wisdom is they're going to take votes away from the Republican candidate. I mean, no Democrat wants them on the stage for any other reason. Now, if there's a mountain party candidate, you know, I doubt that the Democrats would advocate to have that person on the stage. There is Chase Linko Looper. Yeah. And Sam, do you think that person should have? I mean, you didn't mention them in your response. So should that person have been on the stage as well or just Marshall Wilson and, and the libertarian candidate? I think the, the criteria traditionally in these debates is based on the, it should be the amount of support the candidate has in the polling. And that's uh, Marshall Wilson's got a lot of support statewide. I mean, he's he's a very formidable candidate. So I think that's the should be the deciding factor. You know, how relevant is this candidate's view uh, to the electorate? Well, he'll be lucky to make five it? points statewide. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, I mean, what, that's a reality. What, what polls have you seen, Sam, that shows that they do have substantial support? I have not seen that. I don't have the number on hand, but I believe in the metro. The most recent polling I've seen was from Metro News in August. I'll try to pull that up as we're talking up right, here. Let's, but, move, uh, let's move to another constitutional office then, and Secretary of State. Uh, yesterday, I believe it was, we had Thornton Cooper on the program, certainly very experienced, uh, and uh, Chris Warner, who is the brother of the current Secretary of State, uh, Mac Warner. And uh, we've had the opportunity to interview both of these folks this week, uh, in fact. Jason, your breakdown of the Secretary of State race, does this look like a slam dunk for the Republicans? Oh, without question. <clears throat> and Thornton Cooper, who I, who I think I've met a time or two, he's been around a long time in Charleston. Um, I think he's run for several offices in the past, um, n never uh, a successful campaign. Um, and I don't expect this to be the first one. I think uh, the Warner name is very, <clears throat> excuse me, is very well known across the state. Uh, Chris has experience in state government and various um, uh, business interests. So uh, I expect uh, a slam dunk. Sam? You know, the, Warner's main campaign point is that his brother disenfranchised 400,000 voters, kicking them off the voting rolls in West Virginia. I, it blows my mind that that's the platform for running for Secretary of State. But, you know, I think, I hope that voters uh, are ready to elect someone that will help people to vote in West Virginia. I mean, you've got a county commission race in Jefferson County. We've got four great candidates who are trying to run for county commission to just on this very issue, I think, bringing more people to the polls. You guys were talking uh, early voting locations. Our Secretary of State, our county commissioners should be giving Jefferson County voters more than one place to vote early in the elections. I mean, we need to help people vote, not block people from voting. So I hope voters will pick Democrats both for the Secretary of State's race and, and also for Jefferson County. you got Blessing, Friend, Johnson, and, uh, and Walsh running up there. A lot of good candidates who will help people to vote. That's the job of the Secretary of State. We have three early voting locations in Berkeley County, and the clerk, Tony Petrucci, is talking about a potential fourth. There is just one, however, in uh, Jefferson County. Uh, is, is there a concern at all, Jason, in, regarding, in regards to the complaint filed by Ken Reed about Chris Warner and the ties, potential ties to a PAC? And, of course, that complaint goes to the Secretary of State's office and his brother's the Secretary of State. You know, I know a little bit about that uh, complaint. I, I don't know enough that, that I really want to comment here to say whether that's going to have any impact. Uh, I don't think it's going to have any impact in this election. Uh, and I don't just don't know enough if, if, if there's something there that is uh, substantive that would be a problem after Election Day. Treasurer's race is unopposed with Larry Pack uh, is the only candidate. Uh, Sam, how is there not a Democrat running for treasurer in this state? How is it that a constitutional office can be unopposed? You know, we thought we had a candidate for that race, and unfortunately, uh, I can't get into it. Uh, the individual we had we had thought we <laughs> was standing for that uh, kind of dropped out of that for us, and uh, it's a shame, you know. Um, uh, and, and we do our best as a party to put a name in every slot on the ballot. I think you'll see that we have done much better this time than the Democratic Party has done in the past. That's been a focus for the current leadership of the Democratic Party, filling out this ballot with good, strong candidates. And we have, uh, with the exception of that race, some very strong candidates for all of the Board of Works offices this year. Uh, Teresa Torreseva for Attorney General, you know, Williams for Governor, and on down the line. Well, Tori Sava, we interviewed yesterday. Certainly, she has a very extensive uh, legal career. Uh, J.B. McCuskey is the current auditor running for attorney general. How do you see that race going, Sam? 
I think Teresa is really well positioned. She has represented virtually seemingly every uh, police department or firefighters. Uh, you know, fire station around the state fighting for wages. She has uh, a deep connection to the electorate directly. So I'm really optimistic that she will uh, prevail in that race. And that's, you know, that she is a people's lawyer. That's the job of the attorney general. And J.B. McCuskey is sort of a career politician. But uh, hopefully the voters will, will make the right decision in that race. Teresa would be a great attorney general. J.B. has a lot of name recognition. Bill, how do you think he'll do in this race? I think J.B. has a lot of name recognition. And uh, and JB has gotten out and canvassed the uh, the state. Uh, I've not seen his opponent. Maybe she's been here, uh, but I have not seen her nearly as visible as what JB has been. I wouldn't bet against the JB, but uh, <laughs> you're a JB, yeah. Uh, you know, I, th I look. I was first elected in the House uh, with JB McCuskey. Uh, he has served uh, as auditor and, and serving on the finance committee in the past. Any time that uh, we we have budget hearings all the time, and, and JB McCuskey as the state auditor would come up, uh, and nobody presented. Um, uh, their budget and and had the inner workings of their office any better than jb mccuskey he is extremely hands-on he he works it as a full-time job as it is and 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 he is extremely committed uh, to the office uh, that he served as an auditor uh, and i don't have any doubts that he's going to do that as attorney general i think this is another 60 40 race speaking and, of and jb beat a fairly formal opponent in the in the primary so yeah he did uh speaking of auditor mark hunt we'll talk to him on monday we had marianne robot clater actually in studio yesterday she drove in from st albans for the interview, which was uh, pretty amazing. Uh, she's very qualified. She's worked in the auditor's office uh, in, in the past, and uh, she points out that uh, the auditor should be somebody with an accounting background, which she has. Sam, does that seem to be something that will resonate with voters? I think it will. And here's the other point, both on Ms. Clater, who, who is not only experienced, like Teresa Torseva, she's also representative of the electorate. You know, 90% of the elected officials in West Virginia are male and Republican right now. And, you know, when women's rights and women's reproductive freedom is on the ballot, we think it's time, frankly, both parties. I'd love to hear Jason talk about how the Republican Party is going to start uh, fielding women for statewide office in West Virginia. It's really a, fa I think it's a failure of our democracy that we have so few, we have the least women in public office of any state in the country. So Marianne Clater, you know, and Teresa Torseva can, will change that and will protect women's freedom, you know, because they are women and they're, uh, t on top of it, <laughs> supremely experienced and qualified for these jobs. Jason? Well, you know, look, I think that, that Republican voters and, and the Republican Party were looking for the best candidate uh, to fill all these spots, whether that's a man or woman. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that, you know, the, we're, we're not going out here playing the game of identity politics. And I think if you look at um, the makeup of the House and the Senate in West Virginia, there is a higher percentage of Republican women in the, uh, in the, in the, of Republicans in the Republican caucus than there are Democrats in the Democrat caucus. I mean, so, you know, I think it's, I think it's unfair, um, you know, to say that, that Republican, uh, or the Republican Party doesn't want or suggest the Republican Party doesn't want uh, diversity or, or female candidates or elected officials. At the end of the day, voters can only vote for the people that are on the ballot. Let's move on to the Congressional District 2 race, and this is the one that would represent this half of the state, uh, the northern half, Riley Moore and Steve Wendelin. Uh, does Steve Wendelin have a shot uh, in this one at all, uh, Sam? Well, I, I think he does. You know, he's got a history as a, you know, a in the armed forces he's a great candidate been out working really hard and of course he's here for the same reasons reproductive freedom low health care prices building better jobs so I'm, I'm hopeful that he will do well in that race and he's certainly borne the standard for what we what we believe in as what as west virginia democrats what are you hearing jason slam dunk a, a rally's going to cruise to victory I, you know it, it just amazes me that that uh, the first thing out of of every Democratic candidate that's running statewide or in, or for Congress in the state is a, running on a pro-abortion platform in West Virginia. Um, 
I don't know what data they're looking at. I don't know what polls they're looking at. Certainly not looking at election results over the past decade. So if that's the issue they want to continue to campaign on, then they're going to continue to lose 60-40 statewide. Billy? I think the big problem that Steve has is Riley Moore's name, and Riley Moore is exceptionally well-known. Uh, it would be, uh, uh, I think, the first time Steve was on this show for an interview, this point came up that it was an exceptionally steep slope that he's trying to climb now. Let's look at that Senate race. A lot of people disappointed that Jim Justice did not hold even one debate in regards to this uh, Senate race with Glenn Elliott. And Jim said, I'm too busy. I want to, uh, I think he said something in fact of hitting the finish line at full speed, working all the way through, and then he's off in Pennsylvania doing a fundraising event for Donald Trump. So that uh, conflicts with what he said his goal was here. Uh, your thoughts on this, Sam, in regards to the governor's attitude toward the debate with Glenn Elliott? Well, you know, it's really, again, the Republican Party dismissing democracy. I mean, he needs to stand and uh, testify to the people of West Virginia if he wants to represent us. I've spent the last 10 years suing this guy, for, uh, representing his own workers who have been stiffed on their wages, you know, and their benefits. And he has a train of abuses of power in the private sector and the public sector. And the public needs to, you know, he needs to answer for that. Uh, Lord willing, Glenn Elliott will prevail in that race. We need a senator who will actually show up and serve. JB? Uh, I, I'm never going to defend any candidate that doesn't show up for a, at least one debate. Uh, now, I understand the political strategy of this. When you're polling way ahead, a debate can only hurt you. And, and I, I, I fully understand that strategy. It's not one that, that I would use. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, there's just – you have seen what Jim Justice does on Election Day. He wins, and he wins big, and that's not going to change today, uh, on Tuesday. I think this race is a perfect example of how our party systems are failing us. Uh, Elliot, by all indications, is a, a very effective candidate. He's done a great job as mayor. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's very engaging. He's committed. He's just the opposite of what we see with Jim Justice. But I do not think he has a chance because of the party systems. I would love to see us get away from both the Republican and the Democrat and find the uh, uh, ranked choice or some other method that would drive us away from the primary system. It's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah, but I would, but I would like to see that happen. You know, and, and the balance of power in the United States Senate is, Senate is at play. Uh, and and I don't think the the people of West Virginia, um, while Jim Justice might not be their favorite candidate uh, for Republicans, uh, he does mean uh, another vote towards the majority uh, in holding the majority for Republicans, and I think that plays a, a huge factor uh, in in why Republicans are going to vote for Jim Justice. And I yield to that, but that doesn't count in my argument. About oh, and, the and it wasn't intended. Yeah, to. I know. I know that. It was just a but, point. But the other thing, Jason, you need to take it the other step farther. And uh, Gonzalez uh, recently made a comment uh, that it's uh, that justice is going to be expected to vote on major bills, major and minor bills. Will he actually show up to vote on these bills? You, he will give the Republicans the majority. They'll be the, uh, the, the driving force in the Senate. But will he do his part and, and vote on the various bills? That's an unknown. Well, I certainly hope so. And, and you know, I'm going to assume that he is until he shows that he doesn't. Um, and, and I hope that the United States Senate schedule – uh, isn't based around whether Jim Justice is going to show up or not and, and, I, and when votes are going to take place. I hope that is not the case, and I hope that he shows up and does the job that the people of West Virginia are going to elect him to do. Yeah. While many don't think these races in West Virginia will be close, pretty much everybody thinks the national race will be close for the President of the United States. Sam, what are your thoughts on how November 5 is going to shake out for the White House? Well, the polling in West Virginia has certainly shown Trump is down and down a lot from where he was in the past. He has lost a lot of support nationally and in West Virginia, which positions all of the rest of the candidates on the, on the ballot to do better uh, this this time. I think Trump is skating on thin ice. And let me just say, if I may, to Bill's last point, you guys should watch Wes Holden, the independent running against Carol Miller. Uh, the Democrats 
has essentially, you know, uh, well, Holden is essentially running as, as, as on a lot of Democratic issues. That race will test whether West Virginians will vote for an independent who still holds a lot of Democratic values but doesn't uh, endorse the party. I think that'll be a good one to watch. Who do you think wins the White House, Sam? Oh, Harris, every day. She's, she, there has, uh, other than uh, Trump, I think 16 out of the last 17 presidential elections, the most popular candidate has won the election, and Harris is far and away the most popular of these candidates. So I think signs point to a Harris victory, and I will be, it will be a good thing for West Virginia when she wins. And Bill? Yeah, I th- it's a very, very, very close race. It's a close race in uh, uh, the House as well as uh, the President. I'm not sure about the Senate, uh, but it's a it's a crapshoot. It's I think the polls are past the point of being useful. It's going to be turnout. Which of the two parties are best positioned for turnout? Jason? Well, when I look at polling data, and that's really all that we have to go by at this point, and you look at where Hillary Clinton uh polled against Donald Trump, where Joe Biden did, and now where Kamala Harris does. And and Trump uh, is polling better against Harris than he did either of those other two. And when he polled uh, in various uh, battleground states against Clinton, he was down six, five, six, seven points. Uh, those were, I, the, I think the margin of error in those polls were four to five in his favor. Now against Biden, there were s- several states that he was down six or seven on election day, he loses by one or two. In a lot of these states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, states like that, they're all basically dead heats. And if you just look at the data from the past two races, that indicates to me that Trump has an, a couple point advantage uh, in most all of those states. And so I just don't, I think Harris has to run the table on all those. I think that she made a huge mistake by picking the goofy governor from Minnesota to be the running mate, uh, because I think if she doesn't win Pennsylvania, she can't win this race. Uh, And and at this point, I don't see her winning the state of Pennsylvania. Let's go to Amendment 1 to close this up in our final two minutes. Sam, does this Amendment 1 pass in West Virginia or fail? Hard to know, but, uh, you know, Amendment 2 a couple years ago on reproductive freedom was a squeaker, 51-49. So the people of West Virginia have been closely divided on these ballot issues. To Jason's earlier point, I think this one will be close. Bill? Yeah, Amendment 2 a couple years ago was a funding issue, more so than a referendum on abortion itself. It was funding uh, for abortion. So I'm not sure there's a relationship between the two. I think it's going to be very close. I, uh, uh, I had my breakfast group yesterday. Everybody said they were going to vote against it. Uh, but that was an older group of folks, so we'll see. Jason? Uh, I think it fails. I think it should pass. And I think it fails because people don't understand what it actually does. There is no, nothing that is currently legal in the state of West Virginia will be illegal if this amendment passes. And so uh, I, I just, I think these amendments, people, when they go into the ballot box, if they don't know, I think the safe position is to vote no. And I think that's uh, unfortunately what several of them will do. But it's chipping away again in the liberties. Well, I don't, I don't understand how, because it's already illegal Be- in the state. It's not illegal in y- the y- state. Yes, it is. But it's not, yeah, and there's no, there's not a statute that says it's illegal. Yes, it is. It, doctor-assisted suicide, euthanasia, is illegal in the state of West Virginia. All this does is say that it's now in the Constitution, and the legislature can't come in and pass a bill to make it legal. And on that note, we have to close. Sam, thanks so much for your time this morning. Much appreciated. Thank you, guys. Good to see you. Good to talk to you.